have two lectures today in the afternoon, and uh, uh, those will be the uh, lecture number three and number four, uh, given by Professor Timo Niemannen from here, from the University of uh, Queensland in Australia. And uh, uh, those will be uh, focusing on the theory and computer simulations of optical traffic. So let us welcome our speaker. Okay, yesterday was mainly an introduction to the theory, why we have the momentum of waves, uh, some of the scattering theory, and here I want to talk a little bit about how we can put some of this together into computer simulations and then what we can do with this. So, for the first, first lecture of today, I'm going to be talking mainly about our computer code. That was what I finished yesterday with the link to. And just briefly talk about some of our design choices and essentially just repeat our recipe from yesterday and then I'll just go through briefly how some of these are implemented. And of course it's not complete, so I'll just briefly talk about the kind of things that we still need to do. If you've looked at our computer code, I think you'll agree that we still need to do these things. And um, if we have time at the end, I'll just give a few words uh, to... Now people might ask uh, if they've written some computer code. Should they release their computer code to the public? So this, this computer code, this is available to the public. We published a paper describing it. It's available to download. So they don't have to pay anything. We just ask the trained scientists if they use our results in their research. And it's a toolbox in MATLAB. It's a collection of MATLAB functions, collection of MATLAB programs. Uh, you might ask why did we choose MATLAB? Um, this could be seen as maybe restricting our user base because MATLAB's not free. Uh, any, any choice of computer language will restrict your user base. Any choice of platform you want to give compiled code for will restrict your user base. But personally, I found that MATLAB was a very convenient platform for developing and debugging. So whether or not you want to have a final code in that, it's still easy. And one really, really useful thing, uh, the MATLAB user has a user interface already. They can sit there, they can type stuff, the system will understand what they type. So that it begins with a minimal user interface already, and we don't have to have much code put into that. Has anyone written any sort of moderate size applications? <coughs> I, I have found that if all of the user interface code has to be included, the user interface stuff can easily be 75% of the code. Spend a lot of your time uh, writing the code just so that the person can interact with it. Very little time is then available to, for the scientific part of it. So it's easier if you do something where that's already there. And one important thing is that we don't want to have to provide everything in a single program. We can provide essentially some MATLAB functions that someone else can write their own program to go around it. This is much, much easier in something like this. And finally, um, most of what we do is very linear algebra oriented. And the linear algebra tools in MATLAB are quite good. This is, this is a specialty. So we don't have to go and look and find good solvers for linear systems. They're already all there. And finally, I can say that uh, there are other free alternatives. Alex tells me that our code might even run under Octave now, or it will be close to it. You might have to get it by the Yeah. And it's essentially like a free, almost clone. And another design choice that we made, essentially it's just a text interface. You just sit at the MATLAB prompt. There's no graphical interface. Um, one thing I should point out, if you want to write your own code, a text-based interface does not mean that your interface is limited. It's the opposite. If you have a text-based interface, you immediately start with 
something like 104 buttons on your keyboard you can press. Uh, this is it. Each individual thing only does one thing. Text based interface is very, very flexible. Uh, gives you an awful lot of control. Comes with a slight cost. Uh, one thing people will complain about text based interfaces is they'll say that they're ugly. But they're very versatile as opposed to, say, a GUI which might only give you four buttons, four menu choices, or something. So, text based interface is very flexible. Um, and it makes it easier to incorporate into other programs as well. They don't have to deal with getting, other programs don't have to deal with talking to a graphical interface. It makes it harder for the user to learn. There's a steeper learning curve for the user. So if you have a nice web applet, just a couple of boxes, because it is limited, it's very easy for the user to interact with it. Um, if you want it to be more flexible and powerful, you lose that. Uh, in particular, we expect our users to type in stuff like this. And that is harder than choosing things from menus. Okay, what's the key part of the code? It's a T-matrix implementation of light scattering that produces optics <coughs> It's a little bit different from a conventional T-matrix light scattering program because we want the force and the torque and we want to deal with waves, incident waves that are not just plane waves. Plane wave scattering is of most interest to meteorologists and astronomers. They're interested in cross-sections of whole ensembles of particles. We're interested in a focus beam and a single particle at once. So it's a different problem, um, slightly different solution. And what goes into this? For a given particle, we need to calculate the T-matrix. For some, this is really easy. For other particles, it's the single most challenging part of the task. Um, we need to calculate the beam shape coefficients, the multifold amplitudes for the, for the beam. And there's a lot of freedom, really, in how we can do this. We adopted a very simple, very direct numerical method that fits in well with the rest of our code, makes it easy to deal with very generalised beams. Right from the beginning, we were trapping things in the Gauss beams and the like, wanting to model this, so wanted to deal with essentially very flexible input, including possibly some beams we don't have analytical expressions for. So we have used this with experimentally measured fields as the input. Then, for any particular point, we need to find the beam shape coefficients for a coordinate system centered at that point. This isn't necessarily the same as the beam shape coefficients of the focus of the beam. Unless the point is at the focus, they will be different. This is a pain to code and test, but in principle it's, it's simple. Uh, then we need to calculate the scattered field. This is the easiest part. This is one line of that layer code. It's just a T matrix multiplied by a vector of the beam coefficients. This tells us the scattered field coefficients. This is the key thing from the T matrix method, that we just have this linear relationship, we can produce our scattered field immediately. Then we're interested in finding the force and the torque. That's what we want. Uh, other things that you could do and calculate the field at any point in space, over a grid, over all space, these are all possible. The simple case, this is the simple case for calculating a T-matrix. This is for an isotropic homogeneous sphere. This is me theory. This is the Lorentz me solution for what the T-matrix elements are, the scattering coefficients. And, okay, they look ugly. Um, they're a party vessel functions. They involve spherical vessel and spherical Henkel functions. This is okay. MATLAB calculates vessel functions for you. This is all you need. And you can calculate these. So for a sphere, this is very, very easy. This, this is really the easiest part because we've got the analytical solution. If you don't have a computer, then this is very painful. But with a computer, this is easy. Of course, it's an old solution. A lot of the early work was done with the calculations done by hand. 
or on essentially adding machines, and then people put a lot of effort into it. These days, we can beat that in a fraction of a second. And how can we calculate the T-matrix for an arbitrary object? Uh, there are actually all sorts of choices for this, but this is our general recipe. Keeping in mind that the T-matrix is really just a description of the scattering properties of the particle. If we take an infinite field with all of the mode amplitudes except one equal to zero, multiply that by the T-matrix, one column of the T-matrix that matches that is what will appear as the scattering coefficients. So if we can solve the scattering problem with any exact full weight method, we can find the scatter field coefficients from this to correspond to that incident field. So this gives us one column. Um, we might have a large T matrix, so we have to repeat this many times. But we can calculate it column by column. This is a commitment to repeated calculation. But once I have it, I can do a very large number of repeated calculations quite quickly. So um, this might take me some time, but if I'm going to do thousands of calculations, this puts me very, very far ahead. And I just cycle through column by column until it's done. So far, I haven't had to say anything about how the individual scattering calculations are done. In principle, this can be anything. In principle, this could even be an experimental measurement. That would be a very slow way to do it, but in principle, it's possible. If we have a simple particle, there are some restrictions for this to work. The particle needs to be homogeneous, isotropic. Um, it needs to be not too different from a sphere in shape. So it can't be extremely elongated or extremely flattened, but things like, say, cubes, spheroids that aren't too flattened or elongated, they will be quite OK. Particle has to be what we call star-shaped. That means a line from the origin passes through the surface exactly once. So you can write the radius. So radial radius is a function of angle, a simple value. So these are big restrictions. So this really only does apply to simple particles. But inside and outside the particle, we can write the field in terms of some other modes. OK, that's a, an infinite sum. Infinite sums in computers are a bad combination. So we need to truncate this somewhere. Luckily, we can do this quite reliably and accurately. We truncate this at some finite number. So this is determined really by the size of the particle. And in this kind of sum, we have essentially some unknown coefficients. We know our mode functions. They add up to <coughs> the mode field. What we can do, this still isn't useful because this is an equation with lots of functions, if we choose a set of discrete points. And for a simple particle, we will choose these along the boundary. Each point that we choose gives us one equation. We're saying the field at this particular point, that's a number, computers like numbers. We have the field at this point is a number equals our unknown modes times the basis function at that point. And those are numbers too. So essentially, this then gives us a set of linear equations with um, the only unknowns being our mode amplitudes, in this case for the scattered field, maybe the internal field too. And we can relate the fields on both sides of the boundary at these points with our usual boundary conditions. The components of E and H along the boundary must be continuous. And we choose more points than we have unknowns. This is important. This gives us an overdetermined system, and we solve this. And that maybe will do this for us. Um, why is it important for that to be overdetermined? If I take, say, some linear system, 
my red circles up there, and these uh, may be meant to model my nice blue curve. And if there's any sort of noise in these, any error in these, we always have some error, then if I try and fit some polynomial through those exactly, it will go through my points perfectly. This is, I do believe, a fifth order polynomial <coughs> going exactly through six points. It goes exactly through my chosen points. There's no error there at all. In between the points, it does not do what I want. So, you can always exactly fit at the points of interest by fitting the exact polynomial through and it almost never gives you the behaviour that you want because you're interested in what happens in between. What I really want to do is to choose more points even if there's even more error in these and do a least squares fit. So this is a polynomial of the same order fitted through more points and there's more error in these points and it's a better fit. So, overdetermined systems are much, much safer. And this kind of method, where we're essentially solving a linear system, at which we generate by just calculating the field of discrete points. This is called the point matching method. When it's overdetermined, it's usually called generalized point matching method. It's actually uh, one of the family of methods called method of moments. So that's uh, probably the most common electrical engineering name for it. And where can we truncate this? It depends on the size parameter of the particle. Wave number times the radius of a sphere we need to enclose the particle. And, okay, this will give us a very large linear system for a large particle, and it can be quite slow to solve. We're safe a little bit if the particle is rotationally symmetric. Our vector spherical weight functions, they tell us the angular momentum. A rotationally symmetric particle does not couple angular momentum. This means that the value of m, that's actually an <coughs> angular momentum around the z-axis, the z-component of the angular momentum, that doesn't change. So only a very small number of my modes are actually involved. The others I know they're not there, they're not involved. And then it's very fast. For a small particle, seconds will do to calculate the whole T-matrix. Big particle, maybe some tens of seconds. If there's no symmetry like this, it might take a few hours. That will be slow. There's a slight special case if we have a particle with discrete rotational symmetry. It's not as good as complete rotational symmetry, but it's still fairly good. And Essentially, it works the same way as a grating. If we have a grating, if we have one incident plane wave, this has one value of the linear momentum along the grating. We have a discrete plane wave spectrum that's scattered from it. So we have one transverse momentum coming in and only a discrete set of the <coughs> transverse momentum going out. And instead of an infinite possible number of plane wave lines. There's only a discrete set. If we wrap this into a circle, this is essentially a particle with discrete rotational symmetry. Like this, this just that wrapped into a circle. It means most of my angular momenta aren't involved. And if we do this for say a particle like a cube, fourth order rotational symmetry speaks the calculation up by a factor of about 500. Which is worthwhile. If it speeds it up by a factor of 10, 20%, it's not worth making the code more complicated, but a speed up of 500 to 1,000, that is. So here's one example that was done by one of my students. So she simulated the optical trapping of the cube. This was ended up as the cover picture for the journal where we published our code. Uh, purple marks the starting point as it moves into the trap, uh, next to the focus, gets pulled in, and ends up just below the focus 
uh, a quarter up. Okay, but here's one particle that's of a lot of interest to us because it's been involved in a lot of our experimental work. These are these birefringent microspheres that Helena was showing you. They're vaporite, it's calcium carbonate, they rotate in optical tweezers, that's why we're interested in them. Also because they're spherical, very nice fluid flow. And the problems are they're birefringent, they're polycrystalline, they're non-uniform. So they're actually very difficult to calculate the scattering for. If we look at the insides of one, we can see they have all sorts of structure inside. They, they are quite non-uniform. And we think they have this kind of sheaf of weak structure. So the lines on this, the locally, the lines of the optic axis, it's the same kind of thing you can have in a liquid crystal where essentially our, our isotropy can change. It doesn't have to be uniform all the way through. So in this, we think the outer structure is radial, the inside part, the core of it, will look almost like a uniform biofringent material. There's one nice thing about this, the symmetry. It should be rotationally symmetric about my vertical axis through there, about the z-axis. If it's rotationally symmetric, I should be able to solve the scattering from that as a two-dimensional problem. And it's a very general type of object, apart from this rotational symmetry, so we need to attack this with a very general method. So we use a finite difference approximation on a grid, but the grid only needs to be a half plane from the centre to the outside. And on each grid, grid cell, we can have essentially this is like a yeast cell if you've seen the KNS yeast famous pioneer MPPD paper. This is essentially exactly this formulation, uh, but in cylindrical coordinates because it's a rotational coordinate system. Around the blue boundary out there, the boundary conditions are taken care of by our vectorspheric wave function representation. On the z-axis, well, this thing's near an image, so we know what it's doing on the other side. That's, that's the easy boundary. This gives us a large system of equations. We have to solve this, but we do this with our usual key matrix recipe. We just solve the, an overdetermined system once for each column. For a large one of these batterite microspheres, that will be slow. That can take some hours. We're interested in other particles that aren't rotationally symmetric. Okay, I said before we can use our simple point matching method with some symmetry optimizations for a cube. This has the same symmetry as a cube. But the arms are too elongated. Our point matching method will not give good results. It won't give convergence for any realistic number of modes. So we can't use it. Uh, this kind of structure from the symmetry should spin in optical tracks. And they do, in main these. But it's a very general type of structure. So again, we need a very general method. Okay, it's, in principle we could generalise something like our finite difference frequency domain method to this but it was slow enough in two dimensions that we knew it would be far too painfully slow in three dimensions, so this was not going to work. So we looked instead at a method called the discrete dipole approximation, where we essentially divide our scattering object into small dipole scatterers and solve the multiple scattering problem. One nice thing about this is this is how materials really work. because an individual atom or molecule is a Rayleigh scatterer. If we take some object, it's made up of individual atoms. In principle, if you could trick, calculate the scattering by each individual atoms, the multiple scattering problem, you can find the effect of some macroscopic object. Only problem with that is there are too many atoms. This is essentially 
approximating the material with very large atoms. They still need to be small compared to the wavelength. And they uh, work. It's a, sufficient for this type of shape because we don't have to discretize a large volume. We only have to discretize the actual object. So if we have our object like this, this is essentially our uh, final model of our little Lego structure. We can represent it by a bunch of small dipoles. This is what we need to solve the scattering for. This gives us a large linear system to solve. Okay, more linear algebra. This is okay, we can solve this, solve this for the different incident nodes one at a time. The cubes, as I said, we can take advantage of all sorts of symmetry optimizations. We can do the same for this. Because what happens in one quadrant of it will be the same that happens in the next quadrant and the next quadrant. Even better, it's mirror symmetric, top to bottom. So we actually only need to simulate this much of it. What happens at one of those dipoles is mirrored by essentially an image dipole at each of those symmetry locations. So each one of those dipoles can represent eight real ones. And that makes it again much faster. So with that, we can essentially calculate the scattering by an arbitrary object up to the point where our computers won't cope with the memory demands due to the number of dipoles or the time taken to solve the linear system. Uh, we can go up to some tens of thousands of dipoles. Which isn't that large, but it's large enough. So that deals with essentially our main particles of interest. We're interested in simple objects, especially spheres. That's easy, we have the knee solution. Interested in our birefringent and microspheres, our little crystal batterites. And we're interested in basically micro machines. So that's the range of stuff that we're interested in. There's probably particles that other people will want to do that we haven't, but it's possible that some of them can be treated by these methods. I've already heard suggestions here for particles that we've never done, and maybe these will work. The next question is to be, and the short answer is we use the same method for the beam that we use for the particles. We use again a generalised point matching method. We write the beam as the same kind of sum of some modes. We choose some points where we know the field and we just solve an overdetermined linear system. So it's exactly the same as this. Okay, we want to choose these points where we know the field to line on some surface. And what we mainly use is a spherical surface in the far field. So essentially we can treat the objective lens that focuses the beam as something that maps a plane in the back plane of the objective to a curved surface just on the inside of the objective, still in the far field of the object. And the linear system tells us something that looks very much like a beam. Beams look realistic, um, hard to compare with experiment because we need to measure right at the focus. That's not so easy. You can also choose any other surface. This could be done in the near field, if you knew the field there. We generally don't. Um, one convenient choice would be the focal plane. If you can image what the beam looks like, what the field looks like in the focal plane, usually this will be a measurement of the intensity if you're doing this optically. And you'll have to maybe make some assumptions about the parties. But in principle, we can measure what the beam looks like in the focal plane and generate a beam that matches it. Okay, there's other ways to do this. We're essentially doing an integral transform by solving a linear system. Uh, that's because we hate integrating. Well, we don't really, but we had essentially 
were doing this point of matching already, so it's very easy to just apply to the beams as well. So you can do this integral transform by actually integrating. Uh, that's more common. Um, if you have a symmetric beam, Gaussian beams, Laguerre Gauss beams, you can do the as a movable part with the past Fourier transform. You can use localized approximation. You can find the plane wave spectrum. There's an analytical formula for the spherical wave spectrum of a plane wave. It's used in mean theory, but you can use it for this. You need to do this for each plane wave in the spectrum. So there are many, many choices at this point. We need to be able to move the beam. And I don't want to go into the details here, but I can say it's a linear transformation. Uh, general linear trans transformation of our T and T and beam coefficients will involve two matrices. I've written them there as my capital A, capital B. Yes, there's an analytic formula for all of the components of those two matrices. There are even moderately fast ways to calculate those using recursion relations. You don't want to do it in a direct way unless you love factorials and using lots of computer time. But we can calculate that. We can do a similar thing for rotations. We don't want to do a general translation just by applying this formula because it's very <coughs> slow. Our azimuthal index, our m index for these modes, this is the Z component of the angular momentum per photon. If I move up and down the Z axis, that's what I've measured that angular momentum about. That can't change. That angular momentum going up and down an axis won't change that component of the angular momentum. So translations up and down the Z axis are special. They're, they don't couple ends to different ends. All rotations are special too. My total angular momentum is given by my radial index my n. So this is just from the same standard theory of angular momentum that you see in quantum mechanics. It's the same wave functions that you see. And rotating about a point won't change the magnitude of the angular momentum about that point. So rotations are all relatively fast. So it turns out that you want to do general translations by rotate, translate, rotate. We can even make that a little bit faster, do a 90 degree rotation, translate, do a 90 degree rotation and translate, because 90 degree rotation is a little bit easier again. How can we calculate the force of the torque? Well, we want to calculate the pointing vector, we want to integrate the pointing vector, and it turns out, if we're prepared to take the far field limit of this, and we write our fields in terms of our vector spherical wave functions, we can do this analytically. Most of our products of wave functions will disappear. And we're left with some relatively simple formulas for the absorbed power, the force, and the torque. Okay, they're not that simple, but it's much easier than having to numerically calculate the field at a whole grid of points and integrating. Essentially, we have a, an analytical formula that will convert our field coefficients into the force of the torque. To talk about the z-axis is very simple. If you have looked at our code, you will notice that we have almost no documentation. This is a serious defect. Uh, it takes time to write documentation. This is probably one of the most common defects for scientific code. If you're writing your own code, especially if you're intending other people to use it, document it, document it well. Have lots of examples. Have something describing how it works. Explain what to do how to test it, how to debug it, how to modify it. People will want to do these things to it. And it's also the thing that 
people don't tend to do for their own use. Who writes code for their own use? Do you ever write adequate documentation? Can you understand your code when you look at it in, in say, 12 weeks' time? In two years' time? Do you think someone else would be able to understand your code? <laughs> no, documentation is really important. And whether this is comments in the code or some separate documentation, anything you can do here is good. But, as I say, our code doesn't have enough, so I'm saying do what I tell you to do, not do as I do. Um, there's, there's a lot of tasks that we're still expecting the user to do, to check whether the convergence is sufficient, whether the truncation uh, parameters chosen high enough to give good convergence. Uh, if the code was smarter, it would check these things automatically. This is very good if the user has not used the code before, doesn't know what to look for. Um, the lack of documentation makes this worse. So really you should automate as many of the common tasks as possible. Um, the code as it is, is really a snapshot of a project that's evolving. Parts of it were written at different times. Our ideas for what it would do change in the middle of it. And it doesn't all catch up. It's not all at essentially the same evolutionary stage. Parts of it are very old, parts of it were very new at that time. And it's like a snapshot. And the pieces are mostly interoperable, but they're not completely. So if you have time, one thing that's very good is to make sure everything belongs to like a single consistent version. And partly related to all of these above things, that some of our newest pieces of code that we've written aren't included because they were essentially completely unusable without any documentation. And they had just been done, they weren't consistent enough with the rest of the code. So we still need to include those. So when we have time, and this is the kind of thing that we can do uh, for a revision. This is essentially our target for our next major revision. At the moment, we've only been fixing the worst bugs. And something that's not a very high priority is to put some sort of graphical interface. And it's not a very high priority because we don't see it as being that useful. It's not that useful for us. For some users out there, it's probably very useful. So if you want to have a nice programming project, anyone who wants to is welcome to have a, have a go at writing a GUI for our code. Send a copy to us. If we like it, we can include it in our code and list you as one of the contributors to it. But it can take time to do it. If you were to write scientific code, would you be interested in releasing it to the public? Why? Yeah, sharing knowledge. Sharing knowledge, that's a fundamental part of science, right? If it's science, if you keep it secret. reasons to keep it secret. Um, you might keep it secret to try and keep some competitive edge. This is why businesses will keep these things secret. Governments will keep these things secret. Defence departments will keep these things secret. Uh, other people won't release code. And I hope this wouldn't apply to anyone here ever. Other people won't release code because they know it doesn't work properly. <laughs> and they want to hide it. They're ashamed of their code. 
one of the arguments against releasing code, at least for the general masses. So some people will release their code, but they'll only give it to people who ask them for it, so they can keep track of their user base, and presumably if uh, the wrong people ask, they can just not reply or something. Um, it, it will happen uh, that people will misuse the code, they'll even deliberately misuse code in order to get the answers that they want. Um, I don't know what the best answer is other than just maybe ignoring them. But even if all you do is basically describe your theory and algorithms that it's based on, people will still complain about that. As witness the comment on Alex's paper, they didn't look at the code, they're just complaining about our algorithm. But Um, yeah, this is essentially why, why some people get, yeah, they, they want to do a limited release. Send me a postcard, send me an email, and I'll give you a copy of the code. But uh, that's more work if you just put it there and let anyone use it, then, then this is easier. Um, as for protection against misuse, I don't think you have that much. For legal liability, um, don't promise that the code will do whatever you can put in the usual disclaimers that our code is not warranted to be correct, blah, blah, blah. Don't trust our results. <laughs> Just because it comes out of our code. I mean, you know, it's people who put these kinds of things, but do not use this code in any life critical situation. If you kill patients with this code, don't sue us. <laughs> you read the fine print in your end user license agreements? <laughs> Gracias. 